Hi everyone, welcome to Develop Brighton Digital. Uh, thank you so much for joining us to watch this one. Um, it should be a really interesting one. Very briefly, my name's Will Freeman. I'm a freelance video games journalist. I do other bits and pieces in the games industry, but that's not important now. I'm just here to ask questions of our guest. Um, and like you, hopefully, uh, keen to learn a few things and kind of um, discover this what a journey through the games industry can be. Um, so yeah, let's welcome um, Dominic Rebilliard, um, Creative Director at PlayStation. Um, Dominic, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, well, well, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to chatting. Great. Well, um, yeah, I guess we should dive in right at the start, um, which is, you know, where you first found games feeling important in your life, like filling a draw that maybe you wanted to be more involved than just playing them. Yeah, wow, good question. Um, so, you know, my my uh, rest of my family is is all in the film and TV business. So story and narrative um, and kind of cinematic stuff has always been um, part of my, my kind of conversations with my family growing up. Um, but I was also really, really into games. And so back then, you're talking about the kind of uh, Commodore 64, Super Nintendo uh, era. And even back then, I felt that games and the way that they can place a, a player in the middle of a story to drive that forward um, was really going to be what was going to motivate me and kind of keep me passionate um, about about this kind of medium. And uh, back then, there really weren't academic opportunities, really, to get into gaming as a profession. And so I, I kind of supported my interest in story by studying English literature um, through school and at university. Um, and then after that, I, I took a bit of a misstep and uh, got into management consultancy, which right. will move quickly past. I spent a year, a year doing that, um, but I wasn't happy. And right. my uh, my parents really uh, encouraged me to to get into games at that point, mm -hmm. uh, interest because they knew that it was something that I could get passionate about and excited about. Um, and an opportunity to become a tester at Sega came right. up, and that was really the kind of first step. And as I understand it, that was really kind of in the classic Dreamcast era, right? You were as testing. I mean, you know, testing isn't glamorous work, right? But you got you you got to kind of get close to some pretty special titles. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, it was it was right at that, that golden era. Um, one of the first games I got to do QA on was Res, mm -hmm. um, which was amazing. Um, and you know, Crazy Taxi Two, Virtual Tennis Two, Sonic Adventure. Uh, then Shenmue 2 as well. You know, there was there was a lot of amazing projects coming in and out of, of the Sega headquarters down in Chiswick at that point. It was really interesting. And, you know, I guess particularly before the kind of boom in games education, like the going into QA was like the classic starting point for so many people, yeah. right? Like it's, uh, you know, I don't know, the equivalent to a runner or a labourer kind of thing. It's that real starting point. Like how valuable was that? experience your why was that experience valuable to you i i remember when i started um and i didn't really know what to expect that uh i didn't have massive expectations for what it was going to teach me about making games to be honest and when i actually got in there i found that it was going to be way more useful um from an experience point of view um than i thought it would be and people had said you know it's not it's not as glamorous as it sounds you know even though you are technically playing games all day you're basically rinsing games in a very kind of focused way to recreate bugs or find problems, break the game, you know. And um, there's a lot of skill and experience and technique that goes into that. Um, and so I, I ended up benefiting from it in ways that I hadn't expected. And seeing all of these games go through these different stages of development was really, really insightful as an opener to what game development could be and kind of tracking those changes as something goes through the final process in particular was very, very informative. And it gave me this amazing respect and understanding for yeah. QA as a discipline. And what about like QA, you know, as an opportunity to kind of connect with the wider team and kind of assert yourself as wanting to do more than QA? Was, was that an opportunity for you? Um, not so much at Sega um, because it was, it was a compartment away from the development right. process. Um, and this was often dealing with teams that were in Japan. Mm -hmm. And we were on the Chiswick Roundabout in, in London. And yeah. so 
there was a there was a natural separation there and a time zone difference that kept mm -hmm. us apart and everything was filtered through um, the kind of structure of reporting bugs once we got to the point where we were giving suggestions and, and, and actually doing more specific creative feedback it was a bit easier um, and that was an opportunity you know that I, that I had a chance to do that I was very grateful for as well and you know not and I think we're going to you know kind of return to the topic of kind of the value of games education and mentoring and so on but do you f still feel like QA has that value today is it still a you know a, a route that provides opportunity and insight you feel absolutely you know without question um as i've gone through um you know my career the importance of qa user experience imagining your title as it's being played by somebody for the first time um these just become incredibly important things and i've been really lucky enough to work with amazing qa departments yeah um who take it as seriously as that would imply um, the QA at Sony is absolutely world class and, and we've had a really good experience um, with them. And because of that need for creative insight and suggestion um, that comes with that, you know, it's a review process. Yeah. Um, any development team would be stupid uh, not to embrace that and make them as much as part of the process as you possibly can. And, you know, now I think it's fair to say you're a little more senior than a QA, um, but does it still, I wonder if it's valuable in terms of like empathy, like in terms of, when you're at the top of the hierarchy or near the top of the hierarchy, like do you still feel there's a value to your career 20 years on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's just a general, a general lesson um, of inclusivity uh, and understanding all of the different component parts of what it goes into making a game or anything creative, to be honest. Um, you want to make sure that you are listening and leveraging the experience of everybody who's contributing to what you're working on. Um, and like you said, because QA is such a critical part of getting a game finished and ready, um, it's uh, it's something that you have to incorporate and make sure that you include in the development process. And again, at Sony, it's something that is naturally done and emphasised. And of course, after Sega, Sony was your next career step, right? How did how did you come about moving from QA to being involved at Sony the first time round? The first time round, yeah. Um, so my my uh, boss at Sega um, was friends with the lead designer on the Getaway, Tomar Kong, um, and a moment came up when they were looking to grow the team, and they had a level designer, a junior level designer spot open, and they made the connection, and I applied for it. I did a level design test, uh, um, a bunch of interviews, and very very luckily managed to get a spot on that team, uh, and that was the beginning of it, really. And that was working on. The getaway right yeah and how do you you know again we've already you know we've already kind of focused on the value of qa but at the same time doing qa does not make you a game designer like how did you embrace that craft mm -hmm. well i think that um when you join a team uh which stage it's in development greatly influences how you pick up those skills that you need and at that point, Getaway was in production and it was moving at speed and there was a lot of work to be done. And so, you know, learning a lot of these tools and these skills uh, on the job as quickly as possible was that shaped my memory of that moment. You know, picking up Maya, learning Maya and 3D modeling, picking up scripting for the first time. And these were things that were completely alien to me because I had no experience. And um, as we've discussed, there was no kind of academic backdrop for that yeah. type of work. Um, and so I think the answer is you have to pick it up really, really quickly um, and be adaptable. And that's, that's one of those things where you, you need to be ready when you go into a new position to embrace all of that stuff and go with it and, you know, be really, really quick to pick it up. And, um, yeah, I get, you know, how, because it's an interesting thing there, right? You're, you're a creative, you're a designer, and yet as you've kind of climbed through the hierarchy of games, you've kind of got a managerial and overseeing role. Like how quickly did you feel your career start to broaden like that? Was, was that a de deliberate move? Did it happen at Sony then? Um, you know, I, when I got to, to PlayStation, I was just so happy that there was a game being made, you know, where I lived that, that, I could be excited and passionate about, you know, um, and you know there was a big period at the beginning where I was just kind of living the dream, going, "Oh my God, I can't believe yeah. I'm making games for a living." Um, and then as you start to build more experience and you get these big milestones where you ship a game, you finish a game, and you have to start thinking about the future, um, 
you know, it does make you think about, you know, where, where is this going? What am I going to be doing? I think that at the time, I really saw level design and that part of the of the puzzle as something that I was excited about getting on top of and trying to master um, and trying to get better at. And so I think my my the end of my my sight at that point was being a lead level designer, if you will. Right. Um, and then you know as you as you keep going up the the ranks and getting more experience, some of those 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 kind of goalposts change, you know. And I think after that point though. All those goal posts have been influenced by mentorship and people that I've connected with um, who are more senior and more experienced with me and have maybe helped see something in me that, that I didn't realize or hadn't thought about. Um, and so I've been very lucky to have a sequence of very, very uh, great mentors um, who've looked after me and advocated for me along the way. Uh, and that's definitely something that I, I see as being very important for the younger members of our team and also any team that I've, I've worked with as a, as a manager, you know. Yeah, right. It's quite nice that it seems, and I guess it's something maybe we'll come on to a bit later, but that early experience of being mentored has really shaped your approach to the way you work with talent at this, yeah. I need to say this end of your career, not that it's ending, but this this part of your <laughs> career. Um, the, oh yeah, sorry, I've got some news for you. No. Um, so <laughs> yeah, before, before we get to that, it would be really great to hear, um, obviously, you know, Sega, Sony, PlayStation, some pretty iconic gaming entities. And then next it was Lucas, right? Like Lucas Arts mm -hmm. and Lucas Film. So how did that come about? Yeah, I you know, after I'd been um at, at Sony for a, a length of time in London, um I'd had a chance to work on both Gasway games um and some other titles there as well. Um and there were a lot of other things going on in that building um at the time that were really interesting and diverse. You know, you had iToy, SingStar. Mm -hmm. Um, and a, a really interesting concept group. There was so much stuff to learn from. Um, but I remember feeling at that kind of near seven year mark that I felt like I needed something new. Um, and that really was the main, the main reason. And um, at that point in time, somebody that had been on the getaway team, the lead character artist, uh, Dave Smith, he had just uh, made that jump and, and gone to work at, at LucasArts and LucasFilm uh, on the Force Unleashed games mm -hmm. and he let me know that there were more positions opening up and that, that I should go for it and so I thought okay I'm going to do it and I put my my name in there really with an incredibly low expectation that anything would come of it and um, ended up getting a phone interview then another phone interview then another phone interview there were multiple rounds of phone screens it was actually with the Indiana Jones team um, there was, a, there was a, a game being made for that and eventually they ended up firing me out there and and yeah that was the kind of beginning of it i did a bunch of interviews all day interviews got grilled uh, a lot but that was the beginning of that of that process right and how you know how how different was what you had to embrace right like come there's a lot of different game development companies out there and a lot of different approaches and you know especially entities like sony that are made up of multiple teams and even lucas really like did you find yourself having to adapt? Did Was that a challenge? It'd be really interesting to hear about kind of embracing a new arrangement. Yeah. Well, I, you know, again, kind of with the benefit of hindsight, you know, knowing that your experience is often shaped by the stage uh, of a project that you've joined. Um, having worked on these big kind of franchises at, at PlayStation, I was starting to get interested in new IP. And I knew that, you know, obviously Lucasfilm is very famous for huge cinematic things uh you know licenses um but there was another team there that was working on new ip uh, and that was something that was very interesting to me at that point and they were also very early on and so the chance to go and work in another country in a different company with a bunch of people who have a different set of experiences but that are also tackling that beginning part of a project was really really interesting and i think it also was a transition that happened during a bit of a shift in the industry I think people were realizing that as games got more and more complicated, the beginning part, the concepting part of it, the pre-production part of it needs to get a bit more buttoned up um, right. and kind of figuring out ways to stabilize the process as the games were getting more and more expensive uh, and harder to make and the bets and the investments were getting bigger. I mean, this is a problem that that we have to deal with all the way up yeah. to the present day. It's literally the daily thing we do now. but. It was it was um, it was very different, and I and I think the thing that I valued the most um, about working with that team early on, which was called Team Three, um, was was really learning about collaboration, 
um, we had a chance to work in small collaborative pods with a relatively flat hierarchy. And it was my first taste of, of working with a group that shared a vision for something. And there was a lot of ownership and autonomy and the importance of an individual voice, which is something that really kind of spoke to me and has stayed with me for the rest of my career. And, and at that point with Team 3, where, where were you? What was your position in the team? I joined as a senior game designer, I think. Right, okay. uh, yeah, and I was the lead, at that point, I was a lead designer at, at Sony. Um, but it was a no-brainer. It was a no-brainer to kind of take a different position um, just for the benefit, you know, of learning all these new things, working with a whole new bunch of people and, and getting to move to America, you know. And I guess that's a really great position to be in in terms of learning about that collaboration thing, right? You're not at the top or at the bottom. You're in the in, yeah. in the thick of it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course, you know, eventually came the Star Wars game 1313. Um, yeah. And, you know, uh, I'm sure many of our audience will know, but ultimately it wasn't to be, but, it, you know, you and the team went a considerable way into it. Yeah. it. You know, it wasn't like you were a week into it when it got cancelled, mm -hmm. was it? Um, so, yeah, it would just be interesting, I guess, you know, what you learned from that experience. You know, there's, I guess there's professional takeaways, but almost like the personal experience of like getting through something like that, right? Like we all, you know, I, I write for a living and if I lose a Word document I haven't saved, it feels like it takes me a day to get over it, but that doesn't compare to working with a vast team and an ambitious and beloved IP for a considerable time, right? Like how did you, what was that process like? Yeah, I, my goodness. Um, it It is really difficult. It's really hard. It, it, it's also... It's also a reality that that um, a huge number of, of game developers and you know anyone in entertainment design has to deal with this reality sometimes that something you love, something that you've really invested in doesn't um, doesn't come out. Uh, so it's you know I think it's good that people talk about it. <laughs> uh, I I remember at the time being absolutely devastated, obviously, um, but the way that I was trying to pass it and make sense of it, I I remember actively trying to look on all of the positives um that had come about my my amazing you know five years at, at lucasfilm and there are just so many good things to take away from that experience and I, and I think even to this day people say to me oh 1313 i'm so sad that that didn't come out and of course you know i share that sadness yeah, um yeah. the benefits the benefits of working at that incredible company um and meeting the amazing people that i, I worked with and all of the experience i gained in process and production and all of those things kind of really, really outweigh that for me. Right. Um, but it took a lot, it did take a long time to get over. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's like a personal, when, when you care about your work in particular, right. It's a, yeah, it must've, it must've been incredibly affecting. Yeah. It, yeah, it does. And you, you go through, you go through these kind of benchmarks of it's, it's, I don't want to overstate the importance of it, but yeah, there yeah. is a grief process. It feels like that there is grief, involved you know and you go through similar stages where six months down the line you might think oh yeah I, th I think i might kind of be over it <laughs> and then something happens and you realize you're not over it you know um and it takes a long time and then i i learned that the you know the only real way to deal with these moments in your career is to go back to making something and become creative again and become proud of something that you're doing um and that's the only way to act to successfully push that away is to kind of get back to, to making something. Um, and, you know, I was incredibly lucky uh, to have that chance to come back to PlayStation and do something that I didn't realize at the time, but was going to be very specifically suited to that kind of task of rehabilitating me. Yeah, it's fascinating. And I guess, you know, if we've got kind of student or aspiring or, you know, um, kind of rising talent watching this, like it's something that could happen to anyone in games, right? And mm -hmm. You know, I guess that it, 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 how to put it, I don't want to sound all corporate, corporate innovation and talk about failing forward, but like, it, you know, it's can be part of a positive overall journey, it sounds like. And, you know, it might be something anyone watching with a career ahead of them has to, has to Absolutely. brace themselves for. Absolutely. And I, you know, I think that the, the, the most important thing when you're looking at the steps in front of you for a possible career is to make sure that what you're doing um in front of you at any given moment is going to be teaching you something it's going to be helping you grow it's going to be something you can be passionate about that you're working with great people um i mean these are kind of nice to haves um 
not must haves, but these are things that if you keep an eye on regularly for what's in front of you, if they do go wrong and it does evaporate, you have something to look back on that you're excited by and you valued. And that means that there is going to be that potential of learning uh, something important from it. Yeah, really interesting. That's not, yeah, in, or encouraging, hopefully. Um, and yeah, I, it'll be interesting to move, but oh, I'm definitely keen to move back to Sony in a moment. But just briefly, that process of embracing a significant Star Wars IP, right? Like, you know, when we're, when we're talking before going on air, so to speak, there's that notion of like being creatively mentored or trained by LucasArts to kind of take you to that level like what what was that process like yeah I, I think that in a quantifiable um from a quantifiable perspective one of the biggest things that i got from my time at lucas was um getting to work for a couple of years with, with george lucas which was you know as incredible as you would expect and hope um but also the people that i got to work with as part of that were uh was just amazing you know i, I think before before I had my first meeting with George, I had the opportunity to be mentored by some of the other um, leading creatives at, at the company. I was very fortunate to spend um, time with Dave Filoni, who is an incredible uh, creative and you know, probably the most knowledgeable person about Star Wars that I've ever met. Um, and, uh, and lots of other people as well. I had the chance to shadow um, kind of VFX, Oscar winning VFX supervisors at Industrial Light and Magic, do cinematography and photography courses um, with some of the people that, that work there as well. And so there was this rounding out of my skill set um, that I am just so incredibly grateful for. And I draw on now and will do forever. Uh, and those are some of the things that you look back and think, God, what an amazing opportunity that was um, uh, to be able to do that. And I guess it continues that theme of like you've been, you've benefited from being on the receiving end of some incredible mentoring, right? From the Sony experience to the lucas arts and lucas film experience which i guess takes us nicely you know it's not like you went to sony to become a mentor but sony was your next step right yeah and and yeah. what what was your initial where did you initially move to within sony or how did that come about um so when um when i was wrapping things up um at, at lucas uh somebody that i had worked with there for many years uh jeff sangali he was a dear friend and a phenomenally talented art director he had just gone uh, to Sony. Interestingly, he had worked for Sony previously as well <laughs> and was going back for his kind of second tour. And um, he told me about this amazing program uh, that was going on down in the, uh, the San Mateo studio. Um, and so I went down and I, and I met with them and I spoke to Funny Booth and Kenny Nagaki. Um, and they were, uh, they were in the middle of setting up this incredible collaboration with various academic institutions um, across the United States, but primarily with the uh, Entertainment Technology Center at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and they had been working with this very, very talented group of uh, students uh, on that program. And they had decided to build a team around them. And they wanted me to come in and help them and help Jeff with doing that. And I thought, God, what, what an amazing opportunity uh, not just to find out what the state of education is now in games, which, is, as we said before, was not something that was around when I was a kid um, and younger, but also to do something um, very, very different from a game development perspective. And I, I think I was sensing this need to prove to myself at this point with a couple of non-shipped as well as shipped products yeah. behind me, um, prove to myself whether I did actually know how to make a game um, from start to finish. Um, and whether we could kind of guide a team through doing that. And that, that was really the appeal there. So that's quite incredible that, you know, your previous role, you're sort of being trained up with kind of the, you know, the real top of the pile of creatives. And then suddenly with Sony, you're leading a team of relatively, I, mean, I don't want to say inexperienced, right? But these were people fairly new to the world of making games. Like how, yeah, be it, it's just such a fascinating concept, but like, you know, was that a two-way learning process? Was that an education for you, kind of working with people at the start of their careers or close to the start of their careers? That is a great question. I mean, it it was mind-blowing in a way. You know, once I met um, all these incredible developers, seeing the skills that they had been taught as part of their education process, 
uh, was absolutely mind blowing to me. And I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that they were coming out of these various programs. And of course they had an undergraduate and most of them had an undergraduate in computer science and then a master's degree from Carnegie Mellon. And so you're talking about five, usually kind of three to five years worth of kind of cutting edge games development or entertainment design education. And they had skill sets that I don't, I'm not sure I had even when I was 30, you know, <laughs> after being in for, for kind of nine, eight or nine years. I mean, yeah. it really was that kind of a leap. And it wasn't just in the, it wasn't just in the technical skills. It was the, the soft skills, the way that they were comfortable in talking about criticizing their work, things that I had struggled with when I was younger, taking criticism because I was so invested in everything I did, yeah. where they had been taught naturally to solicit feedback on everything they do, like basic things, you know, that now are obviously part of the fabric of, of what every team does. Um, but, you know, 20 years ago, as a young junior designer, I, I had not really kind of encountered before. And so it was absolutely two way learning. And it continues to be that way now, you know. And I think that's something that anyone going through a career in games or anything really should be making sure that they always have those opportunities to learn. Um, and they're looking to learn from everyone around them, wherever they are in that process. And it sounds to me, um, you correct me if I'm wrong, of course, but you're fairly encouraged and optimistic by the kind of progress of game education, the relevance of, re relevance of the students that it's bringing. You, like, it, well, I guess we're talking about what a great path into the industry QA can be. Do you feel similarly about game education as it where it's got to now? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think it's so important. You know, Pixel Opus has grown um, and we now have a mix of veteran senior developers who share that same goal of working with and mentoring new people coming in, into the industry. But we keep making sure um, that we have those opportunities to come in um, to the team from, from, those, from those academic and those university positions, whether it's from internships. We have an amazing intern program and we've hired several of those interns as well. Um, but what, what it leads to is this this incredible experience when you are going to interview and you find that the latest quality of, of where talent is from all these programs, it's definitely a great way to get into the industry. And when you're getting started, one of the most important things is to make sure you have tangible evidence of what you can make as a game creator, whether you're an artist, an engineer, a designer, and the academic courses that are available um, and I've been fortunate enough to kind of catch up with how things are going in the UK and I'm just so impressed you know um, with how it's going over there as well and this gives you that chance to make something that you can show to a potential employer and say hey look I worked on this I, I did this on this thing whether it's a, a solo project or one of the bigger projects that I know are also um, very very common over there being able to speak to something like that um, to a potential higher you know you know future employer in games is so important and it's that you know something you've done I guess personally as a professional and something Sony you've clearly done is like working with those educators and what like I guess what I'm getting to is do you feel there's a kind of I mean it's a positive responsibility a responsibility of the games industry to be engaged with education you know you can have that thing of education existing in isolation from the industry it serves right but I just wonder your thoughts on the importance there and the kind of what the game the games industry's role no absolutely um and i know that that playstation in the uk is very connected um to various uh, universities i mean when we were on the getaway um and it was very new ground we had a great connection with bournemouth um and i believe that carries on today you mm -hmm. know um and so there's the that's just an even bigger network but i, I think games companies uh not only benefit greatly from being involved um, they have a responsibility to do that. And I think that was one of the things that Connie Booth said to me um, on that very, very beginning, uh, you know, the very beginning of this process with Pixel Opus is that um, she felt a strong responsibility to make sure that people entering the industry have the best possible experience um, of games and developing games. And hearing that from her in such a senior position in mm -hmm. PlayStation, very inspirational to me and was like, oh, wouldn't that, wouldn't that be a great thing to be a part of? And I guess, you know, what what you guys were doing with Pixel Opus is a fairly distinct approach. Like, you know, I guess you could and there would be nothing wrong with getting individual, you know, individuals in for internships and placements. And perhaps you could set up a kind of simulation, so to speak, for a studio. But actually to set up a 
a commercial opera, right? It's a, a studio yeah. releasing games that your second most recent game was BAFTA nominated. Like what yeah. what motivate why take that approach to you know, I guess the, the arguments for fostering talent are clear, right? It's beneficial to the future of the industry that we all are part of and make a living out of and that the medium flourishes through. But why what in, what why did Sony do that? No, what inspired Sony to take such a distinct and kind of, com- I don't, you know, I don't want to emphasize commercial, but it it's a proper team that's part of the Sony family, right? That's totally fine. I think it's absolutely fine to talk about the commercial viability because that's absolutely the goal. Um, you know, there's nothing charity uh, based about it, um, and everybody on the team wants to be successful by any metric you know that you can yeah. think of. Um, we're not an art house. Um, we have our <laughs> sensibilities, and you know, uh, the soul and the spirit of the team is to make things that do contribute to the greater good uh, yeah. of games in that sense. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't make something that, that has a AAA sensibility to it or is mainstream and accessible. And these are some of the things that we're striving to get. You look at the trajectory between Entwined and then Concrete Genie and what we're doing as we grow even more for our next mm-hmm. project. Um, it is to get up to that status. And we're, we're so lucky as well to have a deep connection to the other studios, particularly in America. Um, but we have a great um, connection with Media Molecule in uh-huh. Guildford as well, as you would probably expect. Um, and our goal is to get up to that level, you know, and that's very aspirational to be surrounded and supported by people who've been on a similar journey. Yeah. You know, you look at Soccer Punch and there's, we like to see a lot of, of, of ourselves in that journey as well um, as we continue to grow and get to, that, to the, the high quality status there as well. Right. And, you know, it'd be also interesting to hear just, I guess, like what, um, yeah, what Pixel Opus is as a team. Almost, I don't want to say forgetting the setup of like, you know, fostering, forming it from younger talent, from kind of rising yeah. talent, but just as a studio in its own right, like what, I guess, maybe what defines or distinguishes the studio within the Sony family and as, as a studio generally. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the mantra that we hold throughout this entire process and still do is to make beautiful and innovative games that have heart to them. Um, and that's really the goal. And I, I don't think that that is at odds with making something commercially successful. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think with the new, the new project that we're working on, you'll see an even stronger threading of that, of that line, you right. know. Um, but that's something that ties all of us together. And like I said before, you know, even though we have grown, you know, we've roughly doubled in size uh, since Concrete Genie. Um, we're still small, you know, we're still around that 30 person mark. Mm -hmm. And that means that you are going to be sharing that vision and that that aspiration with everybody on the team. We try and keep the the hierarchy as flat as possible to make sure everybody has that void. And so they all need to feel that same goal to make games that fulfill that that, that motive, you know. And, you know, I sort of talking about that flat hierarchy and what... Mm -hmm what is your approach particularly with you know the story we've been discussing has been i guess so informed by collaboration and mentorship and you know the experience you've had with people steering and guiding you i get the mm-hmm. sense you're not an auteur perhaps when you turn the camera off you become an absolute <laughs> monster i don't know but no no you're like i get the feeling you're not an auteur but how how do you how do you approach with all the experience you've had how do you approach for want of a better term running a team yeah, no, that's good. I'm, I'm glad you said that. I'm definitely not an auteur. Um, I, I love being on collaborative teams. I think at times I've thought that, you know, big teams can't be collaborative. That's completely not true. Um, and I think we managed to prove that with the 1313 team. That was a big team that was deeply collaborative in a, in a very structured way. But the type of collaboration that you get on a smaller team does enable you to keep that hierarchy flatter, more transparent, um, and it lets you move quickly and easily when ideas come up, you know. And I think that's something that has also been interesting from a leadership perspective is that leading in that way, I think, is harder than being an author. There are are risks, there are problems and pain points either way, um, but I think it's definitely easier in many ways to just kind of tell somebody what to do and not maybe have to explain yourself, you know. That's the bad version of being an auteur. Yeah, there yeah. are people auteurs out there that do not do that, and I'm very to as well. But it's right. still their, vision. you know, it's their vision yeah. or, or you no. Know. Whereas the, the the structure and the process that you have to put in place to 
make a game that does have all the voices of that team included in it and make it in a timely and structured fashion, that's quite a balancing act. But the benefit is that everybody cares about it. Everybody can see their work expressed in that project. And that's the type of collaboration and kind of this shared autonomous experience that, that I, I really value and like being a part of, you know. And I, I think a lot of my, my management style has developed in a way to create a structure uh -huh. and identify gaps and boxes that we need people to fill and then giving them as much space and autonomy to fill that as possible so they feel like it's theirs, but they just know where it has to fit in and how it's going to influence everything else. Right. And, you know, actually to continue on that point or to elaborate on that point, you know, hopefully we've got some people watching either, I don't know, whether they're in leadership positions, new to leadership positions within studios, or perhaps there'll be many, you know, newer talent forming their own teams. That idea, you know, a, a kind of collaboration, like say wonderful and a democracy ideas, but you've also got to get like the game mm -hmm. finished, right? Yeah. You, you, you mentioned balance, like, uh, I don't know, whether you want to give it as advice or just like what your approach is to the balance of getting the job done and listening yeah. to everyone. <laughs> I know that's a I great oversimplification, but no, it's, it's a, uh, it's a really good point. You know, I think that's one of these contradictions that exists in good, in good leadership and management and lots of things, you know, the team wants to be heard, but they yeah. also need to know that there's a plan. And sometimes those things can feel at odds, you know, and I think that's just something that you have to balance. The way that, that I've learned to, to balance that is making the plan part of it, the overall um, structure of how a game is put together and what those creative milestones are, is very transparently communicated. So that when we come to those decision points, if I do have to make a decision that is built on and leverages all of the, the input from the team, I can explain why we've made that decision and why it is had to happen at a certain point. And so it's this mix of being transparent about when that's going to happen. So it doesn't yeah. come out of nowhere and you're not being seen to be making arbitrary decisions about something or like, oh, my God, Don just gone and decided this um, without knowing why. You know, though, that is one of those big things is, is making sure that all of the every team member needs to have access to all the information about what is going on. I think that's something that uh, is very uh, overarching just generally when you're a leader. I would urge anybody stepping into that position to make sure that they listen to their team. You know, one of my favorite quotes that guides me a lot is if you stop listening to your team, then they'll stop having something to say, which is an absolute disastrous endpoint for that philosophy, you know. Um, so make sure you're listening and don't always feel that you have to have all the answers all the time. I think sometimes it can give that impression of strength to show that you're being considerate and listening to certain things before you deliver a final opinion. Right. And I also what's interesting is, you know, you can take points like, um, you know, getting to work with an ILM VFX supervisor or, you know, ghosting them and all those kind of high profile, those headline experience. But it sounds like this has been informed by that entire journey, right? QA, your time as a junior level designer. So I guess what I'm getting at is, you know, perhaps for people watching that you're in, entire career from the early days right through seems to be something to keep in mind mind right something that can shape absolutely. who you become yeah absolutely um i it totally does and i think one of the interesting things about that is as you're processing experience while you're going through that that journey sometimes bad things can make you think oh when i if i am in charge i'm never going to do that you know yeah. And actually, everything is way more nuanced, nuanced than that. You might come across a decision um, when you're in the trenches uh, from a leader and you're like, I don't get it. And you might not have the opportunity to, to get more explanation from that. And then when you're in that leadership position, you start getting more insight into why certain things are the way they are. Um, but you have that remembrance of how it felt like for yeah. you to be in that position, not have that information and not feel like you were being heard. And I think that's some of the balancing act that you have to do. And I, I, every time I've been on a project that's had bumps in the road or issues with it, um, or something's been cancelled, you know, you you feel like you're working towards. I did it. Oh, maybe this is like five, five, seven, ten years ago. I felt like at some point, I was going to finally figure out how games <laughs> played. And but there was one way that was going to tie all this together and give it meaning. And of course, there isn't. There isn't one way yeah. to, to make it. There just isn't. And there never will be. Like, 
games are too broad, they're too different. There's too many different ways to make them. Teams are too different. And I think you start focusing on developing instincts that can inform different parts of the process to yeah. teach you what good looks like, the concept for pre-production, for production, for finishing. And it's much vaguer. And then you spend time trying to kind of pin that down for each title and with each team and make sure that it fits. I guess, like you say, you know, they're the things that make the medium wonderful, right? The breadth of the medium is why games are so remarkable. The the fact that it exists kind of with the journey of technological progress, but all those things, the breadth is increasing, the technology is moving forward. I guess it, it sounds like accepting that you're never going to get to the end point is perhaps a uh, positive frame of mind to have when working in games. Yeah, absolutely. My God, you've got to roll you've got to roll with that hard like i mean you have to be so flexible um that you know to, to bring it back that was the last thing that george lucas said to me i bumped into him a couple of years ago and we caught up and chatted and that was the last thing he said to me it's always going to be a roller coaster um and you've just got to roll with it you have to kind of bend and flex with all of those things whether it's technology whether it's other parameters around the project um it's just yeah you start developing instinct on a different level to articulate what good looks like i guess that's fairly encouraging if mr lucas is on a roller coaster and still still on that journey then <laughs> it's okay for the rest of us to be right <laughs> exactly yeah and um yeah i guess just as a, a final note as we're almost out of time and you know hopefully this has been the whole uh, the whole of our conversation or all the things you've been saying have been helpful to the audience but would you have a you know somebody who's at the beginning of their journey like you know it's a it's a, a, a naff question i'm asking but so often one that's really helpful to people is that you know that bit of guidance or bit of encouragement in terms of their journey ahead of them or oh, one piece of advice oh my goodness um you've only been in games 20 years so only, yeah there's not much to pick from no <laughs> I think the thing I end up saying the most to, to, to either candidates, whether they're starting or if I'm interviewing or whatever, is be prepared. Like, you have to be prepared for any of these crucial moments where something could go in your favor. When these opportunities come up, you have to be ready for them. Um, if you're going into an interview, research the people that you're going to be talking to. If you're trying to get onto a team, research that team, understand the games that they make, um, understand, you know, how you're going to talk to them and be enthusiastic about that. Um, make sure you have examples to show of your work and that demonstrate your passion for games. Be ready to talk about the things that you love about the industry. Um, you know, I think that that the idea that, that um, you know, it's another one of my favorite quotes that luck is the residue of design. And I think that's something as well that I've always tried to, to remember is that you have to stack the deck of cards in your favor as much as you possibly can. And then things will start improve. You improve your odds of things breaking for you and you need luck. Unfortunately, when you are dealing with a, an industry um, that is oversubscribed by people wanting to get into it, then you need luck. How good you are. You have to have luck. And that means you've got to be prepared for these opportunities when right. they come up. So that thing of like putting yourself in the line of fire of luck, right? You can't necessarily, well, I, I, you know, I don't personally believe in kind of fate and so on, but you can keep yeah. putting yourself in positions where eventually you'll get struck by some luck. Yeah, um, exactly. Well, yeah, we've kind of uh, almost, yeah, pretty much ended on perfect time. I'm quite amazed we managed to resist. I happen to know, dear audience, that Dominic is surrounded by his retro games collection. And um, I think he and I could have spent all of this time just talking about that side of things because I'm quite into it myself. But um, we managed to we managed to resist, right? Um, you don't want to take us through any of your boxes? <laughs> Oh, always, but I'm not sure anybody else is that. No, no, well, I, I, I'd be delighted to. Well, um, you know, it's, it was actually about to disappear off into them then. I, I'd have loved that. Um, yeah, I mean, just absolutely fascinating conversation, like genuinely a real pleasure and really interesting. And I just feel hopefully so useful to our audience. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for, yeah, for your time and effort and all that insight. Really appreciated it. Thanks very much. And thanks to everyone who watched. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. We'll love chatting. And yes, to everybody watching, uh, thank you for, for staying with us as well. Excellent. Right. Well, yeah, we're, we will call that a wrap. And um, yeah, just be sure to go and check out all the other Develop Brighton digital content. There's, there's lots of it. Um, yeah. Thanks, everyone. And goodbye.